The following podcast contains adult language and themes. So don't say we didn't fucking warn you. You're listening to Sarah Talk. It's political. You could run a fucking pet rock against right. Donald Trump, and I would vote for the pet rock. <laughs> yeah. That's where we're at right uh, yeah. now. Yeah. Critical. One of the things that drives me nuts as an atheist is that my polling location is at a church. <laughs> and I don't I don't necessarily have a problem. I'm not going to, like, burst into flames walking into a church. Now, after being on this show and having heard your <laughs> viewpoints on some things, my advice mm. to you is... Don't test this, I won't burst into flame. <laughs> and positively, LGBT positive. In many states, you can still be evicted from housing simply for being gay or transgender. Stand and fight with us. Oh, and occasionally, completely absurd. I don't know if you've ever seen a lightning bug when he flies He's around with a bell. flame, a light coming out of his behind. The lightning bug got a flame coming out of his butt. The oh, lightning. it's a beautiful night tonight. All the sodomites are out. <laughs> and now, from Orlando, Florida, your host, Sarah Austin. Hey, everybody. Welcome to... <laughs> Sarah, yeah, you got to get that on camera. I got one right out of the gate for you, Dan. Welcome to Sarah Talk. I am Sarah Austin in the uh, studio with my lovely wife, Becca. Hello. Uh, we're really liking this sitting on the same side of the table thing. Nice. Yeah. Um, I think I fixed the feed for those of you who were here last week when I tried to do the Facebook and the, the YouTubes at the same time and that didn't work. Uh, I think I figured that out. When we upgraded the software, I think it automatically flipped the quality setting to HD and that was just too much for our bandwidth. I and think. our laptop. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, yes, and the laptop. Uh, I am looking at a camera. I think I finally got one picked out. It's nothing fancy, nothing special. It's pretty cheap. But uh, I'm going to try to get one of those eventually. And uh, and if that works, great. And then uh, then we can add cameras from there. Uh, that would be pretty cool. Um, some programming announcements very briefly here. Uh we we have decided what does that look on your face <laughs> dan says yay hair down yes the hair is down <laughs> yes <laughs> oh, I, I had to look I at it i couldn't chat. i couldn't believe it i was like wait what because i didn't even notice <laughs> um so i just got out of bed i barely brushed it and we came into the studio Woo-hoo. november 6th it's a very important day mm. as we will be talking about momentarily with our special guest but do you know what day that is you got to talk like that. <laughs> oh, I was whispering because it's a secret. So it's not a secret. No, 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 no everyone no. go vote. No, uh, I don't want the Republicans oh, to know. Oh, whatever. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, everybody go vote. And uh, on November 6th, we are going to have a an in-studio live show party. Um, we've invited the, uh, the rotating cast of co-hosts for whoever would like to come and join us. And we're just going to flip on the live stream. I don't know. We haven't decided what time we're going to start yet, but like, I don't know, maybe eight. Are as... you going to make some PowerPoint presentations for N- no. tracking? No. No. It's too I mean, bad I... we can't figure out the green screen I know, thing because we so could good. have like a big, huge blue wave going behind us. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, we're just going to do a live stream that night and talk about the results as they come in and which races that we're, you know, particularly paying attention to and and that sort of thing. So that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, November 6th, I will create a calendar event for that for all y'all mm-hmm. when uh, we have determined at the start time. And if you can't be here and you want to be here in spirit, you can like send us pizza. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. No, I mean, unless you want to. I'm not. Okay, let's uh, <laughs> let's move along here. Uh, our guest tonight is Jordan Allen. Jordan Allen is the National Communications Director of Run With Pride which is an organization that supports LGBTQ Democratic candidates running for Congress. Jordan, welcome to Sarah Talk. Thank you so much for having me on. We are happy to have you. Uh, So let's get right into it. Um, Flesh that out a little bit more for us. What exactly is Run With Pride beyond that basic descriptor? Yeah, so we are the largest LGBTQ PAC in the nation in terms of ground operations, helping congressional candidates, Right now, we have 16 candidates, six of whom are incumbents. We are unique in that we only endorse actually openly LGBTQ candidates. We have a lot of orgs out there who endorse straight cisgender allies, but we think it's really important that our community represents our community in Congress. 
Um, and our focus is really putting people in the field to support candidates getting boots on the ground and ensuring that we have LGBTQ people in Congress who are going to pass the Equality Act, who are going to fight tirelessly for our community. Absolutely. Um, so tell us a bit about your own background and how you got involved in this project. Yeah, so I'm a political activist. I do stuff with uh, within electoral politics, outside of electoral politics. And one of my main missions right now is to highlight candidates who represent progressive values. And so I serve as politics editor at Millennial Politics and host of the Millennial Politics podcast, which everyone should check out, listen to on iTunes. Um, and there I interview candidates and I focus on organizations. So I ended up speaking with uh, Mike Watts, who's the founder of Run With Pride uh, for our Pride Month feature. And I just ended up getting involved. And now I'm currently National Communications Director. I also serve as Chief Policy Strategist at Brand New Congress. So overall, I'm focusing a lot on movement building and trying to ensure that progressive policies and priorities are recognized in electoral politics, not just in 2018, but in the Democratic Party and in electoral politics at large going into the future. So. So give us a little bit more detail as to like exactly what your organization does. Um, so you've identified, say, a, a candidate and uh, and well, first of all, start with that. How do you how do you identify the candidates? Yeah. So unfortunately, there are not a ton of LGBTQ candidates out there, so it's actually pretty easy to end up finding them. But we have a submission section on our website. So if you do know of an LGBTQ candidate running for Congress, feel free to go with run to go to runwithpride.org and submit them. And so we just keep an eye out for LGBTQ candidates running as Democrats and then we reach out to their campaigns. We make sure that they represent our values, they represent the LGBTQ community and will in Congress fight to pass the Equality Act and then we will endorse them. And that entails more than, you know, just putting a Run With Pride sticker on their website. It entails helping connect them to volunteers, helping people get on the ground in their district or in their state to knock on doors, to make the phone calls, make the direct contact with voters that we're seeing make such a big difference in terms of Democratic turnout this year. That's good. You know, I was just thinking, uh, random aside, uh this get it's it's important that you really get in and and get to know all of these candidates because um we were recently talking about a story or or we were about to talk about I don't know I I do so much research for the show I can't keep track of one week for the next um so it, here in Florida we had a uh, a democratic lawmaker um uh, file the legislation for the in god we trust on schools bill which is which is out of the religious rights playbook, and I was astonished to find out that it was a democratic right. uh, uh, representative that that had filed that uh, that stuff. So, um, so let me interject here to say the vote blue no matter what thing. Mm -hmm. eh, maybe <laughs> you should kind of research the candidates. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Proper vetting is always encouraged. Yeah. So, well, that's one of the things that I like about organizations like this is that, you know, uh, you have vetted, you've looked at uh, all of the, these different candidates and you've got a little, uh, you know, a breakdown of where they stand on things. And I, I think that's great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with that. I think it's important to recognize that candidates who do not stand for LGBTQ rights should not be part of the Democratic Party. If we really care about our community, about ensuring that our rights are respected, we need to make sure that everyone on our side actually respects our rights. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, so it seems like uh, in con maybe in, in con uh, contrary to all the angry voices that are out there against us, we're, I think, in an era where LGBTQ candidates are winning, winning more than ever. Um, where LGBTQ candidates are winning, we're winning so bigly. 
We're winning. We're winning in places you wouldn't necessarily expect. No, but so like uh, all up and down the ballot. Um, in 2016, we interviewed Carlos Guillermo Smith, who is a gay Latinx, uh, and he uh, man, and he won his house seat here in Florida. Yeah. Um, we talked with Danica Rome, a trans woman, way back on episode 40, and she went on to win her Virginia state seat. Uh, Christine Hallquist, we're going to talk about her some more tonight later, another trans woman, won the Vermont Democratic primary for governor. So all up and down the board, queer people are running and winning. And and if that doesn't give you hope in this, the darkest of all possible timelines, I'm not entirely sure what will. Mm-hmm. So maybe uh, maybe we call this the rainbow wave instead of the <laughs> blue wave. I kind of like that. I like that, yeah. Um, but that's not to say that we have... Uh, that we've gotten ourselves to, oh, we finally have representation in government. Um, we, we may be at a high water mark for uh, candidates running and maybe even in, in all levels of office. But when we look at Congress specifically, that's really not the case, right? Yeah. Currently, only 0.1% of all elected officials in the U.S. are openly LGBTQ, and we only have seven in Congress. Wow. Yikes. Yeah, that's not that's no. not good. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, no wonder yeah. we haven't uh, gotten anything done. <laughs> so, so talk to us about some of the candidates that Run With Pride has endorsed. Yeah, so you might have heard of Sharice Davids. She recently won her race in Kansas. She, if elected, would not only be the first indigenous congresswoman in U.S. history, she would be the first LGBTQ indigenous what? congresswoman in U.S. history. Wow. So she would have two historic firsts. Uh, she's really great. We have basically, given the lack of representation, almost all of our candidates would end up being historic firsts if they're not already in office. Right. So we also have Gina Ortiz Jones running in Texas. She would be the first openly LGBTQ woman in Texas's congressional delegation. And Texas she would also needs be, lots of help. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a lot. And she would also be the first openly LGBTQ woman in a woman of color in Texas's congressional delegation. Mm. So basically every single candidate you're going to get like multiple historic firsts should they be elected. And I'm pretty confident that they they will be elected in November. Yeah, I think I think we're all pretty hopeful for that blue wave uh or the rainbow wave or both and and I, I, and early voting has been rolling out in in various places now for for primaries so if you're please vote um but we also don't want to get complacent in the way that we thought Hillary was going to win in 2016 right, right. Like we were all mm-hmm. very yeah. confident that this was just locked up uh just wait for the ink to dry and we were done um so so Give flesh that out a little bit more. Where you, your feelings right now on uh, kind of where we are with with balancing that hopefulness but cautious optimism, maybe? Yeah, I saw a tweet earlier today. I, I can't remember by who, but it was like if there was a one in four chance that your plane could crash into the Pacific, then you wouldn't feel confident and treat it as zero percent which is there is statistically supposed to be a one in four chance that Republicans do maintain control of Congress. And as you said it in 2016, we ignored that big chance and it did happen. Um, And whether that be this year because of gerrymandering, like Democrats win the popular vote, but don't win enough seats, which is obviously a big problem that that could even happen in the first place. I think the thing to remember is that If people aren't engaged and they don't like their candidates, just saying vote for the lesser of two evils doesn't work. It Mm -hmm. didn't work in 2016. People need to like their candidates. And that's why we're so focused on direct contact with voters, letting them know who Sharice Davids is, who Gina Ortiz Jones is, so they know that they represent their values and they're real people. They're not people disconnected who are just career politicians who take the, all this corporate money. These are activists. These are veterans, small business owners, nurses, teachers, people who are actually dedicated to their community and to the LGBTQ community. So it's very different being an ally and being able to say you support a struggle 
and then actually living the struggle yeah. and in Congress knowing, hey, I am not going to vote to confirm this anti-LGBTQ judge because mm. an ally might be able to say, oh, that's a that's something I can sacrifice. If it's your life, you don't sacrifice that. And that's why it's so important to have real representation, not just allyship. Not that allyship isn't important, but it is not at all the same thing. You know, I was uh, sorry. I'm reading. Co I can't see the thing because your thing's screwed there. up. I'm That's... I'm trying to read comments on the uh, <laughs> on the live feed. Um, Dan, I'll address that in a moment. Okay, so, <laughs> um, so yeah, I was watching. I I think it was the video of Carlos Guillermo Smith introducing Andrew Gillum at the uh, at the event the other day, um, and I thought. And and Andrew Gillum is is kind of my lean for uh, governor for Florida at same, the at same. the moment and um and and I just thought you know what we were missing in 2016 was I have somebody I want to vote for mm -hmm. I'm not voting against a thing right I'm not voting. Because in all honesty, I didn't love Hillary. I was a Bernie supporter from from the start. Uh, I voted for Hillary because I knew that we couldn't have this the darkest timeline of all uh, that we got. But uh, but I wasn't excited to vote for her. And I think when I look at a lot of these candidates that I'm watching this year, I'm like, oh, I'm excited for these people. Right. Yeah. I have something to vote for. <clears throat> Yeah, I think that's really important because it's just difficult as a Democrat. I, I personally cannot look my fellow queer friend, all of my friends are queer, so just my friends in the eye and say, hey, you should vote for this person because they're a Democrat, but I know that they don't support marriage equality. I know that they don't even want us to be able to use the bathroom, but you should vote for them anyways. Like, I can't sincerely do that. And that's, I, I agree, that's just what's so great about this year. I can look at these candidates and say, hey, they're not just going to like passively want to help us with these pieces of legislation. They're going to be on it like from day one. And that matters so much, especially turning out marginalized communities who generally don't show up to midterms. And honestly, I don't think have been given great reasons to turn out for midterms until this year. Yeah. And hopefully we can carry that momentum through and put forth because uh, we have a lot of options for uh, for 2020. I think a lot of yeah. a lot of good progressive candidates that that could rise up here out of the uh, after the midterms and, and really take off. So hopefully we can uh, maintain that momentum. Yeah, for sure. So uh, Dan had asked in the group um, uh, about. The Fox News uh, comment about Christine Hallquist, and we're going to actually play this <laughs> clip later. Yeah, I know what you're talking uh, about. <laughs> that transgender or whatever it was yeah. they said. Uh, knowing that you, like, th that's kind of out of the scope of, of uh, Run With Pride specifically, but what did you think of that? Pissed me yeah. off. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I thought it was ridiculous. I think what we're seeing right now especially with the transgender community, is that the more visibility we get, the more hatred we get. Yep. And it's just wild because Christine Hallquist is the first, at least major party, gubernatorial nominee in U.S. history who is transgender. And the fact that this is a first doesn't show that trans people have a lot of political power. It shows that we are only gaining steam right now. And... I think it's really important to recognize that a lot of these historic firsts, it's kind of heartbreaking that they are historic firsts. They shouldn't be historic firsts. And so while I'm very excited about her victory, I've spoken with her, I think she's a great candidate. I am also sad every time I have to think about, oh, this is the first time this is happening. Yeah. And I don't know when it's gonna happen again. Hopefully it will happen again in 2020, but there are no guarantees. So the idea that Fox, using incorrect terminology, just horrible grammar, 
is going to diminish this and act like there's suddenly a flip and anti-transgender bigots are being oppressed by the single mm. statewide transgender nominee this year <laughs> is just ridiculous. I, I can't take it seriously at all. Yeah. I mean... Let's let's spend the next five minutes talking about uh, our privilege, you and I. Boy, as a trans person, I have so much privilege. I can go to whatever bathroom I want to go to. Uh, I can. I don't have to worry. Are you kidding me? Yeah, it's incredible Jesus. all the things we can do. Uh, yeah. Anyway, we'll get in. We'll get into that a little bit more later. That oh, that just drove me nuts. Um. Okay. So so back to um. Back to Run With Pride. How can people get involved in the organization? What um, what sorts of things do you need, like, from boots on the ground to help the organization and, and get these candidates uh, supported? Yeah, well, of course, donate. You can go to runwithpride.org. As well as donating, as, as you mentioned, we're doing boots on the ground work. So if you sign up, you just go to the sign up button. We can help connect you to the candidates nearest to you, find whatever fits best for you to actually help them. You know, if you're in the district, you can knock doors, just your neighbor's doors. Uh, remotely, you can phone bank. It's super easy. You know, candidates do provide scripts. They provide all of this information. And it is honestly fun to get involved in a campaign. You are getting in with a community. You're getting in with people who are passionate. So... It's not just uh, a labor of, you know, walking in the heat, going to doors. It's getting to know people, and it's making them understand, especially why LGBTQ issues are so important. And it's so important to connect with our community, and especially to just see other LGBTQ people in the community. You know, we have a lot of candidates running in districts or areas that are generally considered red, and there's this misconception that, oh, queer people only exist in, like, New York City yeah. or something like that. <laughs> but queer people exist all over the country. Queer people exist in rural areas. And something I hear a lot of our candidates talking about is they just have people, especially kids, coming up to them after events and being like, hey, I am closeted and oh. seeing you is so inspiring. Seeing you makes me feel like I can come out. And I realized that people like me exist in my community. And it's just so important, you know, when you're going door to door to realize, hey, I'm not alone in the community. Even if this like went to Donald Trump, it doesn't mean that there aren't queer people and it doesn't mean that we're not connected. And it doesn't mean that we cannot have political power, even if that isn't the case right now, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we talk often, you know, uh, in some of those areas that you might stereotypically think about um you know th they may never have met a trans person and yeah. so you knocking on the door and and let's sit down on the couch and talk about this candidate that i'm excited about um also introduces you to a transgender person and you you'll realize that we're not uh freaks and we're not you know uh we're we're just your neighbors and you know we're interested in a lot of the same and concerned about a lot of the same things you are and we all got to live together on this planet and uh hey let me take you out for lunch sometime you know what i mean like yeah that visibility just you know interacting with uh potential uh voters is is huge well i understand your sentiment there I'm going to need you to define your meaning of freaks. <laughs> well. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that's also to say, get it. You know, now you got me. Now you got me thinking. Of, uh, that's also to say, uh, you know, maybe don't go knock on doors in Cabrini Green. Like there, you got to know uh, your safety is the most important and, you know, keep your own safety in the top of mind. Yes. But Yeah, for sure. Um, I will, let's see, uh, I think we've covered everything. Is there anything that we didn't hit on that you want to make sure we get to? Well, I just like to add to your point about visibility is that, you know, we see from data from polling that most people don't know tr any trans people, but I, I think it's more that they don't think they know any trans yeah. people, <laughs> yeah. but in reality yeah. they do. And such a big part 
of what changed in terms of marriage equality was everyone realizing like, oh, wait, I already know a lot of gay people. I already know a lot of same gender loving people. Like they've always been in my life. They just haven't been out. And that's very much the case with trans people. It's a lot. It's been slower for obvious reasons, all of the dangers, the lack of privileges. Um, But that's that's what matters about having candidates. You know, electoral politics is messy. We have not seen the Democratic Party always be on our side or have the basic humanity tests of supporting LGBTQ people. And that's something that needs to change. And that doesn't change unless we vote, unless we say, hey, this is something you need to stand for. And I need you to stand with these candidates and make sure that across the country they get elected and we're able to speak for ourselves in Congress, in the House, in the Senate. That's going to change everything. And I'm really excited to see that change start in November. Yeah, absolutely. Um, hey, uh, hit us one more time with the uh, the website address and the podcast information. Where can people find you? Yeah, absolutely. So runwithpride.org is our organization's website. Uh, me personally, you can find me on Twitter at Jordan Val Allen. Uh, again, I serve as podcast host of the Millennial Politics podcast. Just search Millennial Politics on iTunes and actually the brand new podcast, which is brand new Congress's podcast, which you can also search on iTunes. So make sure to check all of those out and follow me on Twitter. Awesome. Jordan, uh, thank you so much for joining us on the show tonight. And we we didn't discuss this ahead of time, um, so uh, we can offline about this. But if you find yourself with a little free time on election night and you want to uh, to come back on and chat with us a little bit about how the results are coming in, you're more than welcome to join us. We would love that. I would love that. That sounds awesome. Awesome. Well, we'll set something up offline then. Very cool. Okay, perfect. Great. We'll be in touch. Jordan Allen, thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Jordan Allen, National Communications Director of Run With Pride. Uh, again, head over to runwithpride.org to learn more and get involved. Dan says, you know what's more important than privileges? Rights. <laughs> right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Amen. <sighs> All right. Uh, let's see. Do we want to take a break or do we want to just dig, I, yes. dig into it? I, I yes? need a break. Okay, let's take a break. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm having a muscle cramp. <laughs> oh, gosh. All right, well, then uh, we'll do that. We'll take a break. Uh, We'll come back. We've got some uh, news, some religious topics, Mm -hmm. some LGBTQ topics, some stuff that's probably going to piss you off, as we normally do. And I had to be a journalist. Yeah, (laughs) we had to (laughs) throw together some stories at the last minute. (laughs) All right, we'll be right back. You're listening to Sarah Talk. I was feeling so alone. I was going through a really difficult time. I was embarrassed and a little scared. I didn't want to bother anyone. I didn't think they'd understand. I thought it would just make things worse. It was tough at first, but I did it. It ended up taking a huge weight off my shoulders. I feel a lot better. I'm glad I asked for help. I asked for help. I asked for help. I asked my aunt. I asked my dad. I asked my teacher. I asked my mom. I asked the Trevor Project. Now, I feel like I can get through this. I know that I am brave. You can do this. You can do this. Ask for help. 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 Whatever it is, ask for help. If you're thinking about suicide or need support, call the Trevor Lifeline at 1-866-488-7386. Trained counselors are there to help 24-7. Ask for help. Hello, my friends. This is Sister Mary Atheist of the Church of Religious Avoidance down here in Bumblefuck, Alabama. Now, my friends, my people, my brothers and sisters, do you feel lost? Do you feel that swelling urge to be a part of something better? Well, let the word of Sarah Talk help you. If you've never known the word of Sarah Talk, learn it, live it, love it. Can I get an amen? No? 
Good, cause we don't do that shit round here. My friends, we must all remember that the good word of Saratok doesn't happen for free. So get yourself over to patreon.com slash Saratok and help us spread the word. Plant that seed and help it grow into secular, peer-reviewed empirical evidence for the good of all. In the name of the Sarah, the Becca, and the science-based podcast, amen, hallelujah, and holy shit. Hey everyone, this is Dan Hogan from Mesa, Arizona, and thanks for listening to Sarah Talk Podcast. You know, you're privileged to listen to the show. Not everyone gets to listen. I mean, the dead are not allowed to listen. They don't know what they're missing. Do you know why? Because they're dead. But if you're alive and listening, thanks. And enjoy the rest of the show. Can I just tell you how much I love our listeners? I was just thinking the same exact thing. Uh, also, I thought it was interesting <laughs> that uh, in that bumper, Dan mentions the privilege of listening to Sarah talk. <laughs> <laughs> Is listening to Sarah uh, talk a privilege or a right? Is it? Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a privilege because... I, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Dan wants a knee update. Oh, knee update. How's the yeah. knee surgery recovery? Yeah, I needed a break because I was having a muscle cramp. It had nothing to do with my knee. I've been doing so much dancing lately that <laughs> I was having a hamstring uh, muscle spasm there. So I had to go get a nice pack to put on my butt. <laughs> <laughs> you now you're gonna have to clarify dancing because they're all gonna think that you're out at the bar line dancing like you used to do when back no, in the day. No, I'm line dancing in the living room with the headphones with on. the toddler. Oh with the, no, <laughs> well with the toddler sometimes, but usually just with my headphones in. No, with the toddler, it's the uh, the dance play mat with the little preschool worm light up that, thing that yeah. does freeze dance. <laughs> um, but no, the knee is doing great, so I'm back to pretty much. I'd say I'm I'm pretty close to 100%. Yeah. Um you know, I've got I think three more physical therapy visits and we're going to try to get a little bit more just to squeeze as much as we can out of range of motion. Um because that's not quite perfect, but as far as activities and being able to do what a normal person my age should be able to do. I'm doing excellent. You like raced across the room earlier. And yeah, we surprised were, my parents. We were on uh, FaceTime with uh, the grandparents, and they, they were always asking too, "What's up with the knee?" So mm -hmm. I told Sarah, "I said, flip the camera around. I'm gonna run across the room, <laughs> they, so they can see me walk." Mother in law, <laughs> where's like... the fire? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Anyway, let's. Let's get the worst stories out of the way first. That's a great this is, idea. This is what I try to do. So we had a nice positive talk yes. with Jordan. Jordan, and now you're that pull us down. I again am, and, and then we're gonna maybe come back okay. up. I I'll try to bring you back up. <laughs> I'll try to get it up again. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I've got a story about that too. Oh, good. So th <laughs> thank you again, Jordan. That was that was a lot of fun. That was great, and uh, she's gonna come back on with us for uh, for the. The election special. That'll be cool. Very good. Uh, and I have other special friends uh, that I'm working on lining up, too. You have special friends? Yeah, my special friend John from the Wayward Willis <laughs> mm -hmm. is going to come talk to us. And I'm working on John. some He's other coming things. coming here? No, I oh, wish. Oh, man, that would be so cool. be so much fun. Yeah, we definitely need pizza and liquor delivered. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. All right. Uh, content warning. Ugh. I know. Gross. We're going to talk about... Um, more, more religious-based harms against children in the worst ways possible. So if you need to put a pin in this and listen to it in pieces or skip it entirely or, or whatever, that's completely okay. And let's watch the numbers drop off the live stream. Mm, right. All, just all three of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, the first story. John Coltharp, a 34-year-old doomsday cult leader in central Utah, has been sentenced to 26 years to life in prison for child bigamy and sodomy. He pled guilty to the charges in June, having inflicted trauma on six children, and in exchange, uh, San Pete County prosecutors dismissed the charges of kidnapping and obstruction of justice. In cases like these, is the plea deal thing, I, geez, I just have some concerns. 
I, I don't feel like if oh uh, no, I don't. I don't think it should be allowed. The freaking child, right? I mean, you know. Okay, so if you if you confess to robbing that store, we'll lessen your sentence. Right. Okay. Sure. Like if you didn't kill but somebody children... or hurt somebody mm. like that, like yeah. you know, yeah. Like even rape, I don't think. I just don't think it's appropriate when you've destroyed somebody's life. I'm sure there is a good legal reason that someone will call comment. your friends over. Where's Sharon? She liked the slink. Uh. <laughs> I'm sure there's a good legal reason why that that is useful. Uh, it's just okay. Cole Tharp, along with Samuel Schaefer, also 34, who was also brought on charges of obstruction, child bigamy, and lewdness involving a child had started a polygamous doomsday cult together, Knights of the Crystal Blade, which was based on fundamentalist Mormon teachings. And side note, I did not print out this story for inclusion today, uh, but the Mormons don't want to be called Mormons anymore. Whoa. I don't know if you saw that or not. I had not seen that. Nope, so we can't call it uh, fundamentalist Mormon teachings. We have to call it fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints teachings. They don't, oh, Jesus they don't want to be called more, and they don't want you to use LDS as a. Oh my uh, God! Nope, you got a full thing, or like, it was uh, Church of Jesus Christ for Latter Day Saints, or you know, the Church of Jesus Christ. It's kind of funny they went from like a short thing to a long thing because the Jehovah's Witnesses have always been like Jehovah's Witnesses in Watchtower, and the Watchtower. Do, Watch do they like is... being called JW? <sighs> well, but that's the thing. Like it used to be like the what? Like it was like the. Watchtower Bible and Track Society of yeah, whatever, yeah. but now they're like jwor.org dot org yeah. is on everything. It's like yeah. five letters and a dot. <laughs> right. So that I I, I don't know. <laughs> Flip flops. Victoria says cases like these make the no death penalty argument hard to stick with. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the emotional reaction is yeah. uh, let's go string these fuckers up from a tree. Mm -hmm. But don't even just. <laughs> I know. They conspired to hide Coltharp's kids from the more I read, the more angry I'll get. Right. So just hold on. Yeah. They conspired to hide Coltharp's kids from his ex wife, and the resulting Amber Alert led police to a makeshift shipping container home out in the desert. He kidnapped four children last year. Police found two in the makeshift home, and the other two were found hiding in empty water barrels in near freezing temperatures. What the uh, Cole Tharp and Schaefer believed they were prophets. And of course they, they did. They believed they were receiving revelations from God. Because of course they did. You're right. Again, I hear voices in my head, uh, and the voice in my head, uh, Bob, tells me to go do stupid shit. Uh, we book you into a psychiatric unit for a while mm -hmm. and uh, poke your brain a little bit and see what's going on in there. Uh, I hear uh, I hear voices, but and it's God, and and God told me to do some things. Meh, it's God. Well, now, if you harm other people, then they actually do care about that. But well, but for the it, most depending part, on who finds out about it, yeah, most churches will we're just coming cover to that it story up. Story and... in a moment. Uh, a third man, thirty-four-year-old Robert Rowe, was also charged with one count of sodomy on a child after he joined the cult, having met the other men on Facebook. Coltharp and Schaefer claimed to be betrothed to each other's daughters. Coltharp's daughter, eight, and Schaefer's daughter, seven. Now, I had clips lined up to play from this, but they needed some editing. Um, Sorry. So I'm not going to play them because I didn't get a, I didn't have time to edit them. Uh, but essentially, uh, Coltharp in the and the court proceeding says, quote, My marriage was the right thing to do. If I'm a sex offender for what I've done, if I go to the other side, I'll be in good company with all those other sex offenders I've read about in the scriptures. He declared there was a war against straight white men in the world and blamed feminism. Again, the, the dying gasps of privilege lost. He told the judge he had religious freedom to practice his beliefs, which included child marriage, and took issue with waiting until they were 18. Uh, midway through his remarks, he declared that the Lord was speaking to him, directing him to speak. There's changes coming to the world, he says, including this state. Those changes are close. This government will be overthrown, as will all the governments of the world. He was unapologetic about any trauma caused to the children, arguing that the state inflicted that upon them. 
Yeah. What? Quote, I love the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I taught it to my children and wives, which may be the same thing. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. That was my... I, I, yeah, emphasis I, I, mine. I, I, yeah. Uh, and I'm sorry for the things they had to suffer that are truly bad, he told the judge. Just, wow. Yep. Uh, hey, if your God tells you to harm people, especially children, it... fuck your God. I just can't, ugh. Yeah. I want to know where in the Bible Jesus did this to children because everything I read in the Bible about Jesus was not about him harming children. Jesus loved the little children. I'm, I mean, all the you, children of the okay, world. Stop it. Red and yellow, no. black and white. Stop That's it. the most racist fucking song we ever learned. I've never learned that song. No? No. Oh my God. We need to do a. Re Is oh. that a church song? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's why I, <sighs> I only knew kingdom melodies. Oh, God. We need to... About going door to door and myriads of brothers and from house to house, from door to door. What? Yeah, that was a song. <laughs> Jehovah's name we praise or preach or something. Holy shit. Yeah. Oh my God. Okay, well, horrible. I hope this doesn't violate somebody's <laughs> copyright, but I'm going to play a little bit of it. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll see. I don't know. My brother gave me some CDs. They might be old kingdom melodies. Because I was going to use them for a craft project. Oh, God. <laughs> I have to look and see if they're, they're the old, old ones or just the new old ones that don't have the old. Yeah. Oh, I have it muted. I think. I don't know. Okay. This is the shit we learned. I'm sorry for those of you who are triggered. This is the shit we learned in Sunday school. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, please tell me they're going to sing it. Come on. This is the most racist bit fucking oh, video on YouTube because there's. I can't. Okay. I'm... <laughs> oh okay. Oh my god. Um, sorry for that. <laughs> Russell, you're welcome. What did he say? He said, thank you for making me throw up in my mouth a little there, Becca. Um, Victoria says, suffer the little children come on to me. Did not mean no, that. No, not at all. Oh, my gosh. Oh, God. Um, okay. Ay, ay, ay. Are we going up yet? Nope. The <laughs> next story comes from a listener, Zach, who I just realized uh, we have a listener, Zach, from California. I didn't know oh, that. Oh, that's awesome. So, uh, hi, Zach. Hi, Zach. Um, but also, I realized uh, just recently that uh, Zach lives in California, and so um, I, I hope you're safe. Yeah, absolutely. With all of the wildfires, I know it's a big fucking state, and um, and you may not like. I'm not sure exactly where you are, but basically the whole fucking state's on fire. So because of because of the gays, because but, God right. is burning yeah, yeah. California no, down. Yeah, absolutely. Because the gays of, yeah. and abortion. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so let us know how you're doing out aye, there. Aye, aye. There was a young boy, a three year old. Abdul Ghani Wahaj, who was reported as missing by his mother in December. She said the father took the boy to a park in Georgia and never came back. Hmm. New Mexico prosecutors believe the boy died during a religious ritual at a desert compound. What the fuck is it with these desert people? And rituals. I'm sorry, that sounded pretty racist too. I didn't mean that. <laughs> First Utah... <laughs> Now Mexico, those those deserts, not the Dan, other deserts. Dan, you're out in Arizona. Do, can you uh, clarify the desert people theory? It was not <laughs> meant to be nearly as racist as it came across. <laughs> Sand people. It's a Star Wars thing. <laughs> yes. Yes. Sand, what does sand people the travel sand. in the straight line, oh, in a single file line? Something like that. I don't uh, know. Okay. Five adults and 11 children, ages 1 to 15, were found at this desert compound, living in filthy and dangerous conditions on the northern edge of New Mexico, and the children were malnourished. <sighs> the compound was surrounded by tires and a berm. They had no food or fresh water, and authorities found multiple loaded guns within easy reach of the children. Some of those children's statements... Back up the story of what reportedly happened to Wahaj. 
the religious ritual was meant to free the boy's body from demons. Uh, at one point, one of the adults said that they believed he was dead, but only still animated because he was possessed by demons. Oh, my God. During the ritual, the boy's father recited verses of the Quran and put his hands on his son's head, though his defense attorney says they're just trying to paint it in a negative light. He argues that he was just praying and laying hands on his son in the same way a Christian faith healer believer might, mm. might do. Uh, it was it allegedly believed that after his death, he would come back as Jesus. So that's a thing. The fuck kind of fucked up religious... Yep. nonsense is that yeah it's so so like <sighs> twisted and quirky too because if they're muslim i thought jesus was just a prophet and not the son of god are and... they a well are they a one-off though or are they like they use the quran but they you know right like, like blend it blend it together they've made up their own sci-fi version of muslim but right <laughs> And you get your own planet, and you. Oh my god! Um, Where's the are there? Are there gas cans and instead of golden tablets? I don't know. <laughs> You're a mess. I am a mess. On what would have been the boy's <sighs> fourth birthday, and uh, listen, we're only laughing through this because that's the only fucking way you right. can you can possibly do it, uh, and maintain any any sense of anything yeah if you're listening not watching me on the video I'm, yeah I'm, uh oh. on what would have been the boy's fourth birthday authorities found the remains of a young boy buried in an underground tunnel at the back of that compound and they believe that this is the remains of wahaj but confirmation testing is pending wahaj's father was one of the adults at the compound along with four others who are all related by blood or marriage and nine of the 11 children on the property were the children of two of the other adults. Charges for the adults range from child abuse to harbor harboring a fugitive. Ugh. Now, you hear stories like this, right? <clears throat> and you probably think it's outrageous, it's disgusting, it's horrific, and you're not wrong. But you might also think, how uncommon this is, right? You might think, oh, well, we only hear about this once every once in a while, and uh, it, it's maybe kind of an anomaly that you found two stories in one week. Um, mm -hmm. and, and certainly the circumstances are uncommon, like this level of depravity and torture and, mm -hmm. and disgust. But it's not really any different <clears throat> from the astronomical numbers of children sexually abused in the Catholic Church, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and others. It's not a lot different. A grand jury report released this week shows internal documents from six Catholic dioceses in Pennsylvania show that more than 300 predator priests have been credibly accused of sexually abusing more than 1,000 victims. And they add the actual number of victims who never came forward or whose records may have been lost are probably in the thousands. FBI agents investigated clergy sexual abuse all the way back to 1947 in these Pen Pennsylvania dioceses. Grand jurors said that almost <clears throat> every instance of abuse we found is too old to be prosecuted. Of course. But charges were filed against two priests. They described priests and other Catholic leaders victimizing boys and girls, teens, and prepubescent children. Some used alcohol to facilitate their rapes. In some cases, the violations were violent and sadist, using whips. And in one of the cases, a group of Catholic priests ran a child pornography ring. <sighs> there was uh, another case of uh, one of these children dying because uh, the, the rape was just so violent that the child ended up in the hospital and got addicted to, like, opioids or whatever, and overdosed and killed himself. Oh my god. Later. So this child pornography ring. These priests would identify children that they thought were good candidates. Ugh. They would give them a cross as a gift that they could wear and that would signal to oh, the other perverts. Oh my god. 
mm-hmm. that they had been chosen and would be uh, good targets. And then they would arrange photo sessions in the rectory with these children naked. And what happened? The Catholic Church covered it all up. There are church documents confirming that the Vatican was notified of the oh, incidents. Oh, my God. The priests were moved to other areas, which is a fucking classic Catholic move. And then nothing happened. If you've got a strong stomach and you want to read this 1,356-page report, I don't know why you would, but I'll link it in the show notes. Um, and I'll spare you from hearing even more of these horrific stories now. Um, but the bottom line here is this. Religion, and no religion is safe from this. Religion creates an environment where authoritarian leaders have few, if any, checks or balances. They have complete access to vulnerable children who don't fucking know better, whose parents, delirious with the idea of God's holy protection or some shit, are indoctrinated to trust those leaders implicitly. Not to question them. It fosters an environment where perverts thrive, there are no bright lights, there's no accountability, and children get taken advantage of. Why? Again, why would you continue to worship a God who allows this shit to happen to children by men who claim to be men of God, no less? Now, I posted this on my Facebook. I don't post on my public Facebook very often, but I did today because this pissed me off. And um, and it was the Andrew Seidel blog uh, write-up yeah. about how if you are Catholic at any level, you're culpable in this, that you are part of this problem, right? If you, if you go back to your church on Sunday, you're part of the problem. If you put money in the fucking hat, you're part of the problem. I would even say, maybe if you, if you don't say, if you just say, I'm a Catholic, I don't know why you're still a Catholic. And maybe that needs to come along with a, I'm a Catholic, but that is some bullshit and the church better change their policies. But that needs to come with action too, because what if they don't change their policies? Mm -hmm. And the Pope has been talking about this and saying, you know, platitudes and shit about, you know, how bad this is. But until it stops, you're part of the problem. You have to hold them accountable. Or get the fuck out. If you're still a Catholic today, after, after this, and you take your children into that church, that's akin to child abuse, as far as child endangerment, as far as I'm concerned. You are placing your children in a position. And don't give me this not all priests bullshit. I even got some of that on my Facebook. Hashtag not all priests. What the fuck are you talking about? Mm -hmm. There is an above average chance that your child is going to be molested in a Catholic church. Well, Why would you take that chance? Like Jordan said about the, you know, the analogy with the plane. And if, there, if it's one in four chance that your plane is going to go down. So if you're... Like it's the same thing. I mean, why would you put your children in danger if you know that the odds are against? Right. Uh, I was supposed to grab your dad. I know. I saw that. And pull you away from the mic when you were screaming, but I was so horrified and angry that I forgot I was supposed to do that. Sorry, Dan. So I'll link to this report. If yeah. You, you know, I don't know why I would. Um. Just round of drinks on the house. <laughs> We can't provide you a Zoloft dance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So let's take another break because that was a lot. And I want to give you a chance to catch your breath after that. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. I'm going to go get some more ice from my drink. Yeah. And um, yeah. Queer news next. You're listening to Sarah Talk.
In today's health conscious society, you have many beverage choices, but do you know what's in all of them? So much sugar, sodium, and things you can't even pronounce. Dihydrogen monoxide. What's that? Sometimes you wish you just had a simple, more elegant solution for your beverage needs. Introducing H2O, the first ever chemical free thirst quencher. H2O is simple, simply composed of three portions of two elements, hydrogen and oxygen. H2O means chemical free, unlike water, which is filled with all sorts of shit. When we tested H2O, we found traces of no other elements. So pure, the bottle may as well be fucking empty. With all the same nutritional content as a breath of cool mountain air, First widely featured on Goop.com, actress Gwyneth Paltrow revealed that she exclusively uses H2O for her vaginal steaming process. After all, why use water when you can steam it with H2O? So now we invite you to run out to your local garden hose and drink that shit. Remember, it's not water, it's H2O. H2O bottled by Flint Bottling Company in Flint, Michigan. Product not actually endorsed by Goop or Gwyneth Paltrow. Please do not use H2O for vaginal steaming, or better yet, please do not steam your vagina. H2O is actually just water. Water is a set of molecular compounds. It's a chemical. Everything is a chemical. Today we decided to walk to school. The light counted. 15, 14. 31? I mean, 13? We took a left on Carroll Street. Danny's smart, but he gets distracted. I realized he forgot his homework. I hope he doesn't have another bad day at school. When you can see learning and attention issues from their side, you can be on their side. That's why there's understood.org, a free resource for the parents of the one in five kids with learning and attention issues. Go from misunderstanding to understood.org. Brought to you by Understood and the Ad Council. Hey, this is Morgan Stevenson tuning in from Kalamazoo, Michigan at the Sarah Talk Podcast. <laughs> Kalamazoo, Michigan. Thanks, Morgan. Hey, girl. Uh, I'll say it again. Our listeners are, are great. I love love you guys so much. Uh, if you, too, want to create a bumper or a, a, a thing for us, you can record <laughs> one and a thing for us. send it to producer at saratalk.com or uh, call and leave a message at 224-40-SARAH, <clears throat> Um I do still have a couple left. Victoria made us another one. Um, I don't think I've I'm, heard that one. I'm yet. pretty sure if I remember right. That's just remember. that's just the that's Victoria. Oh, okay. Maybe yeah. I did hear that one then. Um and Mandy made one too. That uh and those I just haven't got around to, to put together. Right. So uh stay tuned for that. But we'd love to to have some more of them to rotate around. It's a lot of fun. Okay. So I mentioned uh we talked a little bit about this with Jordan. In the first segment, big news for Democrats this week out of Vermont. Christine Hallquist, former utility executive, made history as the first transgender candidate to be nominated for a governorship by a major political party. She bested three other candidates in uh, Vermont's Democratic primary. Now, she didn't have a lot of opposition in the primary, really, um, as far as, like, who ran. <laughs> But in the general, she's going to face incumbent Governor Phil Scott, who, other than losing some popularity after passing that gun control measure we mm. talked about earlier this year, he, he, uh, Republican governor, uh, passed a uh, pretty strict gun control measure earlier this year, and uh, and his base kind of turned on him. So there's that in play. Um, so, he, but still, he has a good likelihood of being reelected. So that's when we're watching. That's and uh, again on the election night show, we'll be keeping an eye on that. Mm -hmm. But Tucker Carlson on uh, Fox News and I I've been trying to come up with a description of this guy that I like because he uh, he just he looks like I don't know, maybe the lost Brady or something. I I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know what to call him. But he has this dorky look about him. This guy. Oh. Yeah, okay. Um, on his Fox News show, was talking with guest Robin Biro, a former Obama campaign official, and Chadwick Moore, conservative journalist. Now, if your Sounds name is like Chadwick. Gives, <laughs> gives him away a little bit there. Uh, yeesh. And here is what they had to say. Generals. I mean, let's be real. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they, and by the so way, these are I've always thought they were probably liberals. Yeah. 
Well, well you know, these elements. are the most fringe elements. She's calling them out. You know, I don't want to be uh, besmirch her free right to speech. Okay. Uh, okay, but, you know, but, but as a on. transgender but, 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 woman, she's come under a lot of criticism. No, but, oh, well, I don't know if she has or not. She's probably, I think she's celebrated for it, actually. Let's stop pretending. Of course she is celebrated for it. But let me ask you, this. I'm not attacking this person. I'm just saying, if, right. if Chadwick, if you're upset about people killing others for being gay, and I think we should be upset about that, it's awful. Yes. Is Christianity the, the, the primary offender there? Or even I'm pretty close? sure. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not close at all. I'm pretty sure there's another oh, large no, world religion that uh, oh, there is, is. Much known for it. But yeah. Could you say that? Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to even say the name of it without getting uh, harassed by the FL, oh. uh, SPLC and God knows who else. You're okay. <laughs> that was a lot. So oh, listen. my God. Listen. I, I and I missed the beginning of this, but the conversation should not be just who is killing the LGBTQ people, right? Because there is a difference between the things that happen here in the U.S. and the things that happen globally, right? Sure. Yes, absolutely. They are trying to say that Islam uh, teaches people to go push facts it off rooftops. That's what they're trying to say. Go push the faggots off the rooftops. Right? And yes, that happens in Islamic majority countries. That absolutely is a thing. You're right. Doesn't happen here because <laughs> our religious extremists are oh. Christians <laughs> who want to just take our basic constitutional rights away. Uh. So they're not killing us. You're right. But they're still harming us. Okay. Wow. You're absolutely right to uh, to acknowledge uh, Hallquist's transgender privilege. Stop. Privilege. Again, I say. Show me the privilege. <sighs> oh my gosh. I have the privilege of worrying every time I'm out in public. I have the privilege of going to get my blood drawn every six months, and. Uh, and I make an appointment because I don't want to have to sit in the waiting room any longer than I have to. I have the privilege of going into waiting rooms in doctor's offices and, and uh, so forth and, and <clears throat> creatively selecting a seat whereby I can see the entire room and have a clear path to an exit. These are things I think about. That's not privilege. Oh, wait, you forgot the privilege of hoping that your good pharmacist is at the pharmacy mm. and doesn't question you about well, why you need those oh, drugs. Man, I poured that one really hard. Well, it was a pretty Shit. tense segment. <laughs> oh, oh man. I hate it when I can't read these. <laughs> I'm on another tab. Okay, I'll Hang get on. it in a minute. <laughs> when the comments are too long, my phone doesn't show the whole thing. Right. <laughs> She can get away with many, many things simply by being transgender. I mean, what? What can she get away with wow. simply by being transgender? Going into the women's bathroom. No. No. Nope, can't even nope, do she that. She can't do that. Um, no. Nope. <laughs> mm. Who knows if that's even how uh, she she won this this uh, primary? But uh, while what? the entire country is fixated on the fact that she's transgender, nobody knows anything about her policies. In fact, all we can think of, I all do. we know. Well, did you hear the other guy? Um, Bria, uh, Biro, he says, I, I do. <laughs> Nobody knows anything about her policies. And he's like, I actually, I do. Uh, and and if you go to her website, they're right they're there. Right there. I mean, uh, mm. I mean, she's got a platform. It's, and this, and remember, Chadwick is a conservative journalist. So do your journalistic fucking research and go to her website. Right? What a dumbass. Yeah, yeah, you know that she's for uh, Medicaid for all. She's yeah. for. Uh, she's a climate alarmist. She okay? Climate alarmist. Wow. Really? Oh my God! What in the world is going on in this country? We're in a post-truth moment in time. That's what's going on. Truth doesn't matter. <sighs> He uh, believes in $15 minimum wage, and that's kind of it. I mean, she was on CNN this morning, Not uh, looking half Not dead, correct. Very, very low energy. She was on CNN what? this morning, and she couldn't even answer the question about what socialism is. She said, I don't know what socialism is. I'm not qualified. She was asked if she believed in capitalism, and she couldn't even answer that question. Uh, who is this person? Okay, so this is something that I think we're going to see more of as we run up to the election. 
um, there, there have been in the progressive camp it, uh, a number of uh, self-labeled uh, social socialist, democratic socialist candidates who are doing really well. Casio uh, Cortez, mm-hmm. that, that yeah. one, that, that right, <clears throat> and and so I think what we might see it play out in uh, in maybe a lesser form. So if Bernie had won the primary in twenty six in twenty sixteen, if if he had won, and it was Trump v Bernie, I think you would have seen, like, what does he have to attack Bernie on? Nothing. Right. Bernie has like no skeletons in the closet. He it would have been a lot of big words that didn't mean he, anything. He would like, have. He, he would have yeah. only only been able to attack the socialist right. uh, policy. Um, and Trump's an idiot. He doesn't know anything about policy. Right. I think that's been uh, demonstrated by him many times. Mm-hmm. Um. <clears throat> so. <laughs> The, uh, There's the, a charging cable in somewhere. Go get it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, on my side of the bed. Oh my God. Uh, this is what happens when your eight-year-old uh, <laughs> device to is about to die. The hell was I saying? Um, so, so, he's gonna text so I think you're going to see. I think you're going to see a, a a maybe lesser form of that happen here, as we have candidates like Andrew Gil- uh, Gillum and uh, and Hallquist. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> kids Total um, distraction right yeah uh <laughs> you know as as the the as the democratic party leans a little further to the left i think uh i think that's they're they're gonna attack that and you're and you're kind of hearing it here all we know is it's well, someone who's transgender and let's just celebrate that uh can they lead the entire is, state of vermont let a whole fucking utility company you have fucking Donald Trump try to lead the United States of America, <laughs> and all he knows about is where to get a good taco bowl. Does he really? No. <laughs> well, what would happen, Robin, That's... if she had said there is a great world religion that actually has a long <laughs> and recent track record of murdering gay people? How did we get back onto this? <clears throat> and she just said that. Yes. What would her fellow Democrats have said to her, I wonder? Are you talking about the Muslim faith? Yes. That was Biro, the, the Democrat on the panel. I, I'm, ta- I'm talking about the one Abrahamic faith that has a long and recent track record of murdering gays. Yeah, that would not be Christianity yes, or of Judaism. Course. What uh, would happen right, if she right, said that's uh, factually true? Would she be considered brave it's, it for saying that? factually true. In my opinion, yes. Uh, you know, I, I'm a veteran, well, of course. That's uh, that's a problem. So, uh, you know, she would have been correct to have asserted that, just as she is correct to to call out people like Westboro Church and some of the radical extremists. Uh, they're radical extremists in every religion, and I think that ra- when you become radicalized, regardless of your faith, I think that's a problem. Just like Westboro Church, as you were very correct yeah. to point out. You're talking uh, about that's, ten. That's well, no, but that's not. But that's not talking, actually. No, but that's right. not actually true. I mean, in this country. It's, and in Western Europe, it leaders speak for two regions. In the last 20 years, anyway, there hasn't been a lot of Christian terrorism, actually. And there's been a lot of Islamic terrorism. It's not an attack on all Muslims. I like a lot of Muslims. But let's be real. But we, but you, <laughs> that's not oh about Oh, my God. I don't have a problem with black people. I have a friend that's a black person. <sighs> Jesus. He really just played that card. Shrieking Christ. So, again. <laughs> I just can't. When you... Yeah, but when you look at the attacks that are happening on the community, again, always coming from the the religious position in America, in America, uh, it's not terrorism, no, but it's still a problem. And so, are we splitting hairs? Over is this she... a nuance problem? Yeah. Well, it's a Fox News problem. Like, yeah. Um, I don't know that like the the stuff that happens overseas should never come up in this kind of a discussion. Right. She's, We're she's talking going to about be a, a candidate state for governor, senator, or governor. governor a state, uh, so a governor. She's not going to be dealing with anything going on over right. where those murders are happening. Well said. Like, so why does it matter? 
you can't be honest, can you, Chadwick? I mean, there's a penalty for just stating the obvious and the factually true. Well, I don't, you know, I don't understand this, this sort of left-wing LGBT obsession with Christians. I imagine a lot of it comes from, uh, you know, the, uh, Hawkins talks about uh, growing up in a Catholic school and because he was a f an effeminate little boy, in his words, uh, you know, getting, uh, uh, getting a bunch of garbage from the nuns and the priests. Okay, fine. No! That, has, that is not it at all. And, and maybe, for her, that was a component of it. But if you want to know what the problems the LGBTQ have with the Christian, uh, listen to Sarah talk, because that's what we talk about every fucking week. My problems are you want religious liberty at the cost of anything. You want, um, you want to be able to deny people services. You want to be able to deny people uh, rights under our, that are granted under a constitution. You want to uh, discriminate openly using the cover of religion. That's the problem that the LGBTQ community has with the religious community. And that's why I find it really hard to, to I find it really hard to, to justify in my brain uh, when I meet someone who is queer and Christian. And, and I'm like, what? I, pff, how does that work out for you? It's like the Christian scientists. They're also confusing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm back. The difference between uh, left-wing LGBTs and conservative and libertarian LGBTs is we can actually grow up and get over it and move on. And we don't still blame all of our problems on things that happened to us for children. Obviously, Christianity has moved leaps and bounds. American society in general has moved leaps and bounds from probably when Hallquist was a child. Again, we're, not, we're the, being uh, the things that happened to her as a child, uh, very Im impactful, I'm sure. But again, we're talking about today, and these are the things that are happening in the country right now. Are you fucking kidding me? Yet you still blame? Like, why are you blaming an entire religion for no. all of your problems? Because you're causing all of my problems. Mm hmm If not for a faith group who's told by a faith leader who read a book of faith, <laughs> thou shalt not allow trans people into the restroom. If not for <laughs> those people... I wouldn't have hardly as many problems as I have. I wouldn't have near the troubles that I have. Again, when you come at my community, they're always wearing either a MAGA hat or carrying a Bible or generally both. That was the other thing that I couldn't get with this guy, talking about uh, gay people who are conservative. That's hard for me to wrap my head yeah. around. I get that there are... And and I don't maybe you're fiscally conservative but socially liberal. I, I but I just don't understand how you can get, get in bed with that party. It's very confusing. And like we talked with Jordan about you know, uh, ev even Democrats that don't support us, right? right? Yeah. At least most Democrats support our community, right? But uh, of the Republican Party. <sighs> that doesn't happen at all. And the, yeah, you're right. Let the, me the, jump these in radicalized that. Christians, there's like ten of them in the country. Did you oh hear, my god! Did you hear? Uh, <laughs> did you hear Biro's try to let me jump in there? And they do, he doesn't let him. Let me roll that back for a minute. It's only ten. Leaps and bounds from probably when Hawkwist was a child. Yet you still blame. Like, why are you blaming an entire religion for no. all of your problems? And the, yeah, you're right. Let the, me the, jump these in These radicalized that. Christians. There's like ten of them in the country. Who cares? Now, first of all. There's like 10 of them in the country who cares bullshit. Uh, they are a small group, sure, but come on. Bureau tries to say, oh, let me jump in there. And then... Gentlemen, I'm well, sorry. Gentlemen, I'm sorry, we're out of time. Wow. Yikes. <clears throat> um, hey, do you remember that Christian Baker... From Masterpiece Cake Shop, who refused to bake a cake for a gay wedding. Yeah, I do remember. Yep. He's back! <laughs> oh. First, 
uh, let us remind the jury that the Supreme Court ruled very narrowly for Jack Phillips in the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. They were concerned that the Colorado Civil Rights Commission were meanie heads to the guy, <laughs> showing hostility towards his religious belief. Now, the next case started June 26th, 2017, the very day that the Supreme Court agreed to hear the wedding cake case. Oh, Okay, that okay. makes sense then. I don't know that they're connected. There's no, no evidence to support that. But it would... Okay. Okay. Got Autumn it. Scardina, a lawyer in Denver, called up Masterpiece Cake Shop with her own order, a birthday cake. From what I could find, it wasn't very clear if Scardina was aware of the Supreme Court case at the time or, I wouldn't think so. or whether this was, was related. If it was the same day that they decided to hear it, then it right. wouldn't have hit the news yet. So, according to a complaint she filed with the Colorado Civil Rights Commission, quote, they asked what I wanted the cake to look like, and I explained I was celebrating my birthday on July 6th, 2017, and that it would also be the seventh year of my transition from male to female. When I explained that I am transsexual, and that I wanted my birthday cake to celebrate my transition by having a blue exterior and a pink interior, they told me they will not make the cake based on their religious beliefs. The woman on the phone told me they do not make cakes for uh, celebrating gender changes. The woman on the phone did not object to my request for a birthday cake until I told her I was celebrating my transition from male to female. Mm -hmm. I believe other people who request birthday <clears throat> cakes get to select the color and theme of their cake. <clears throat> and she says the woman at the bakery then hung up the phone. Now, the commission, again, uh, con uh, considering the Colorado An Anti-Discrimination Act, which bans places of public accommodation from discriminating against customers based on their sexual orientation or gender identity, found probable cause on June 28, 2018, that Phillips broke the law, again, when he declined to make a cake for the trans woman. Now, so far, the commission hasn't said anything hostile to Phillips' uh, religion, but also, unlike the wedding cake, asking for a birthday cake, while designed to reflect the gender transition, was not going to be used in any ceremony celebrating her transition. And that sets it apart from the wedding cake mm -hmm. argument that Phillips made about being compelled to create a message used in a ceremony that went against his religious beliefs. That's what he said. <laughs> right. Furthermore, Phillips told the New York Times in September about the first lawsuit I'll make you a birthday cake, shower cakes, cookies, brownies. I just can't make a cake for a same-sex wedding. Ooh, sounds like he's stepping in it now. <laughs> as long as um, the commission stops being meanie heads. Michael makes a great point. He says, I'm so glad the Supreme Court is making all the decisions about cake. So important. <laughs> right? <Yep. laughs> so true. <sighs> Uh, Phillips is making a three-prong argument. He's asking the court for an exemption from the Anti-Discrimination Act because it would infringe upon his First Amendment free exercise of religion. Mm. Uh, which, again, we we have court precedent that uh, that the the government can infringe upon your religious rights to a point. He also says it violates his First Amendment right to free speech because it would compel him to make a pro-transgender cake. And it's two different colors. Okay. <laughs> and he says Colorado officials have infringed upon his 14th Amendment right to the due process for subjecting him to, quote, an unfair and biased administrative enforcement, adjudication, and review process. You're being a meanie head. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> so this case, as long as the commission remains neutral towards religion in the way that they handle the case, could end up right back at the Supreme Court, and it probably will, which I will remind you is leaning further to the right every day and will be even more so when Kavanaugh gets confirmed. Right. I, I do want to know, like, like you know, if she had just said, I need a cake that says, yeah. happy birthday with my name. I want the outside yep. to be blue. I want the inside to be pink. And there was no other discussion. Right. They would have made the cake. It makes you wonder, because of all of that detail, it makes you wonder if she was testing them. If if this was a, 
you know, a planned event to try to, you know, I don't know. I don't know. It's hard to tell. But but at the same time, the timeline, if it had, I don't know, I'd have to look, go back and do yeah. the digging and see, like, when did this hit the news? Right. Because it, w- then, it had been in the news. The Before Supreme Court just court? hadn't agreed to okay. hear it yet. Oh, yeah. Okay. It, so it had gone to the commission. It right. had gone to lower courts. It had to work its Got way it. through the court system before the Supreme Court would hear it. Okay. Yeah. So it was a high-profile okay. case. Um, and if it does rise to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court agrees to hear this new case, they would actually be forced to consider the merits of the case. Right? So in the previous case, they just went... Um, so we're not really going to say anything about whether or not a business has the right to deny someone's service because of their religious beliefs. Right. But we are going to rule on the fact that the Colorado Commission was being meanie heads. So don't be meanie heads. And that's it. That's That was their ruling. So I don't know if I want this to come to the Supreme Court or not, knowing the makeup of the Supreme Court. The next story, while we're talking about transgender mm-hmm. folks. An Oklahoma middle school closed down this week Mm. over a 12-year-old trans girl. Oh, boy. Maddie, and this is a pseudonym for her safety. Okay. Maddie has publicly identified as a girl for the past two years. She had been using a separate but equal staff bathroom to avoid being harassed. It was one of her first days at the middle school, and apparently uh, she had not been told where the staff bathroom was. She needed to go, so she went. According to her mother, she used the girls' restroom one time. Another parent found out that Maddie used the girls' room and posted in a private Facebook group of parents in the school. Jamie Crenshaw wrote, quote, The transgender is already using the girls' bathroom. We have been told how the school has gone above and beyond to make sure he has his own restroom, yet he is still using the girls'. Then other parents dogpiled. How old is this thing? One said. Another replied, This thing! I love it! Got a name for it now. Perfect name. Yet another said, This is terrible. Y'all have great kids, and a little half-baked maggot is causing them probs. We feel for y'all. Now, if that's not bad enough, and this is why I worry about my own existence in the school. Right. Oh my God. Where's the transgender privilege? Then it turned to threats of violence. If he wants to be a female, make him female. A good sharp knife will do the job really quick. Another said, just tell the kids to kick ass in the bathroom and it won't want to come back. Tell me where the trans privilege is. Other parents responded to the threats against the seventh grader by staging a small, silent rally to support Maddie outside of the school. Law enforcement officials reportedly asked the school to shut down for the day, fearing a counter-protest. A different demonstration, it looked like, was held on Wednesday with around, when the school opened back up, with around 20 people showing up in the rural Oklahoma town to support Maddie. They wore red in solidarity and duct taped their mouths to show that they wanted to speak with their actions, not words. Police had an area for counter protesters set up, but nobody showed up. Fucking spineless jellyfish hiding in your little Facebook group. Right? Yeah. But oh my gosh. That's that sometimes that's so much worse when you're dealing with teenagers. Because these parents will, you know how many of them went and said to their kids. Oh, yeah. You know. Oh, my God. Maddie's mother already filed a protective order against one of the parents. The good news, the FBI is investigating the threats against Maddie. But this is a child. You guys, this is a 12-year-old. Right. I just can't even imagine. I mean, my one of my best friends who has a daughter that age. Mm-hmm. I could not imagine. I. Uh, and you know, 
I would say I understand why people homeschool their kids. But the people who homeschool their kids are these assholes in the Facebook group <laughs> who want Jesus in school and no mm. trannies. That's what they... Those are the people... Uh, yeah, I... Almost, Dan. Ugh. Almost. Um, in fact, the final story, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Now, we've been covering a lot of this in God We Trust in Schools nonsense, right? Mm-hmm. Which, again, is the first wave of Project Blitz. It's an effort by evangelicals to fucking take America over. And I'll mention again, I did a deep dive on uh, this topic with John and Ron over on the Wayward Willis podcast. I miss you, Logan. Uh, if you want to get into the weeds of uh, what Project Blitz is, you can listen to that episode. Uh, we shared it in the group. I'm going to put it on saratalk.com so you can get to it easily. And, and I've also been talking with Maddie Love about um, an appearance on Atheist Talk to talk about that there as well. So there's another news story floating around that on its face maybe kind of looks positive, but let's break it down here and see. The Carter County School Board in Tennessee is resisting their state's new law requiring that all schools display in God We Trust on every campus or building. <clears throat> Chairman Rusty Barnett says, ain't that a great Tennessee name? Rusty Barnett says... Is it Barnett or Barnett? Barnett. <laughs> sure. <laughs> says they're stuck between the new state law and a federal court injunction from a 1988 lawsuit settlement. <laughs> Okay, let me read a bit from that final judgment in uh, Sonia Smith et al. v. CBM Ministries Incorporated, 1988. Class action lawsuit, class action claims, section one, the above named defendants, and there were several, acknowledged that religious activities occurred in the Carter County school system on public school property during public school hours during the 1986-87 school year, and that such activities violated the well-settled First Amendment rights of the individual plaintiffs and class members. Well, maybe not so well-settled anymore, but I guess in the 80s it was. Two, the above-named defendants agree that a permanent injunction should issue against them, perpetually restraining and prohibiting them in their official capacities and their successors, agents and employees, from allowing, approving, or encouraging religious activities in the Carter County school system on public school property during public school hours. Three, the above-named defendants having acknowledged that certain religious activities in the Carter County school system violated the plaintiff's well-established constitutional rights, agree to pay the named plaintiffs an undisclosed amount of money as damages, attorney's fees and costs, the amount of which is subject to a non-disclosure agreement between the parties. Insofar as the monetary settlement involves minor plaintiffs, the parties seek a court approval. Okay, so we all agree that was a violation of the constitutional rights, and we're going to pay some money for it. So there's the precedent. The school district has an injunction which seems to conflict with the new state law. Two different lawyers for the school board advised them not to participate in the In God We Trust thing because of that injunction. Dun, dun, dun. And you will have to defer to Sharon or Andrew here, but uh, how, how do those two play together? But the problem here is that the board wants to hang up the In God We Trust sign because it's fucking Tennessee, and of course they do. Right. Barnett said, we are not happy with this, but we are held liable if something happens, and we go against this injunction, and we could be held personally liable. <laughs> I've talked to several board members, and we are all unhappy with the situation, but we have to go by the court order. He also said that the school board members plan to take the issue back to court to make sure the motto is placed in every uh, Carter County school. So uh, they probably want prayer in before the football games and shit, too. And they're would... probably already praying before the football games and shit, too. Uh, probably. <laughs> Right. But again, if it's student led and there's no coaches right. or administrators or teachers or school employees involved, then and it's not over the loudspeaker. Like there is there's, there is there's yeah. a judicial precedent for all of this stuff uh that, that breaks down what we can and can't do in school. Um so here's my question. If this thing goes back to court, right, they're they're 
saying that they're going to, to take it to court. So this is what I want to know, Sharon, if you're listening. Um, what's likely to happen? Can they, like, pull back this injunction? Would they more likely than that, would they rule that in God we trust is, you know, tradition and ceremonial deism and isn't, you know, Jesus daddy we trust, um, and give it an exemption, right? If the court, if they take it to court and the court says, well, you know, in God we trust is ceremonial deism, and, uh, you know, there's precedent for that too, which is fucking stupid. Um, but there it is, you know, that doesn't mean the Christian God, even though it's capital G God, and the Christians really do mean it to be the capital G Christian God. <laughs> um, but, yeah, uh, but, you know, would that be the workaround? I don't know. It'd be interesting. I don't know. I am working on, um, I touched base with the production company that helped with our intro. And I'm working on an intro for the Florida Man segment, Ooh. but I don't know what it what I want it to be. So I'm taking suggestions. If you have any ideas on what the Florida Man, I want to do a little jingle, short, <laughs> short, right? Not ten seconds, maybe. Yeah. Uh, intro to the Florida Man segment, because otherwise we're just gonna keep going. The best stories start with uh, Florida Man. I would love to have a song to play. I think that'd be great. Uh, why am I reaching over here as if I need to do something? I have no <laughs> idea. That was funny, though. Do you want to go first? I can go first. This is You have an outsider. This is an outsider. This is a competitor for the Florida man. Houston, Texas is where it all went down. I'm already excited, Houston. <clears throat> a 68-year-old woman shot a man after she noticed him masturbating outside of her house. Granny Jean said, <laughs> Wait, what? Her name is Granny Jean. Oh, that's brilliant. She was at home caring for her disabled grandson when the unidentified 38 year old man showed up on his bike. She said he pulled off his pants and started playing with his thing. <laughs> he ran up to the door and she warned him that she would, that he should get away from her door or she would shoot. When she realized he wasn't listening, she went to get her pistol. She said he kept coming and reached for the door, so I shot through the door. Oh, my God. <laughs> Granny fired just one shot, hit the man in the chest. Um, he's expected to be okay, but he did need surgery. Uh, she went on to say, I don't bother nobody. I don't get in nobody's business. And like I keep saying, I warned him. Wow. <laughs> That's special. Right? Ah. <sighs> All right, so I have our Florida man then for tonight. A Florida man was arrested after being caught on camera lacing a female co-worker's drink hmm. with semen. Oh. Robert Tyson, 62, worked at a dermatology office in Tallahassee with the 37-year-old woman. She told police that she was drinking the water last month when she noticed a distinct taste and smell. After a closer look, she observed a white colored. You're going to be able to make it? <laughs> oh, I was trying not to spit Victoria. my. Victoria. <laughs> okay, L let me finish this and then you can come back to that. After a closer look, she observed a white colored mucus substance floating atop the water. Police said surveillance footage inside the office showed Tyson sneaking up to the woman's desk on June 26th and July 2nd. When she had stepped away and poured a substance from a specimen jar into her water mug, she told police she thought he may have been targeting her due to previous clashes over her management style. He admitted to the HR team that he did pour a liquid into her cup because he was exhausted at work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess. He said in, uh, I wrote in an email, I'm attaching a letter of admission of guilt and a plea to end this matter quickly. I pray it will. My life is a total wreck right now. Tyson was arrested earlier this month on a battery charge and was properly terminated from his job. Um, now. Michael, I, before you even do this, Michael just 
gave away the title in the comments, but I want you to know I had already written that down <laughs> for my story. <laughs> I'm, I'm voting for mine. I don't know why you're even looking at me. <laughs> no, but Victoria had a great comment oh, oh, and then about Vic yours. Victoria said about mine, she just shot before he did. <laughs> That's why I almost choked on my tea, people. How would the stand your ground law work in that case? I don't want to know. Well, All right, your choices tonight. Granny, get your gun. <laughs> or two Floridians, one cup. Oh, God. <laughs> That's oh, nasty. Oh, man. I think I like yours, too. The the uh, My story was too, like, a salty. <laughs> <laughs> Not salty. Salty. <laughs> oh, salty, a too, salty. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, yeah. All right. In both cases, they um, involved some guy playing with his thing. Everybody likes you. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, you're not wrong. Uh, everybody likes Granny Get Your Gun so far in the uh, in the Facebook group. You know, one of these days, I will elevate someone from the, the, the actual, from the listener group mm. to moderator, and they can post these things, because I forget oh. every week. <laughs> I get so wrapped up in editing the show and getting oh it posted gosh. and all of this. Uh, so there you go. All right. What a good show. It's good. Yeah. Hopefully, better news coming up. Yeah, really. Jesus Christ, I'm so tired of this. Um, I, I was thinking about this. I would like to ask our listeners okay. for yes. some help. So I am working on a new project. Oh, yeah. I'm going to start my very own podcast. I didn't know we were going to announce this yet. I know. Good. Well, oh, you I've sprung got, it on I'm, yeah, I like it. Good. So I'm going to start my own podcast, and it's going to be called... Well, I shouldn't tell you what it's going to be called. Yeah, maybe I should. Yeah, go for it. You we better not have the steal it, people. We, we already have the domain name registered. <laughs> oh, okay. So. All right. Well, that's good then. Yeah. Um, It's going to be called Ask an Apostate. And I'm basically going to tackle a question. And I think I want to keep it short, like 30-minute episodes. Yeah, tops maybe. Because I don't, yeah, I don't want it to be like, <laughs> like how like we this. sit around and <laughs> talk for two hours. Yeah, about. maybe fifteen, <laughs> twenty, yeah, thirty minutes. Like, yeah. yeah, thirty at the at the most. Yeah. Um, but each each episode is going to tackle a different different question, so focus mostly on on uh, JW stuff. Um, so I would like our listeners, if you please, send me some questions because I need to get a, the first few episodes. Written out and going. I have a few ideas, but I'm, you know, feeling a little bit of a creative drain. So if there's anything you ever wanted to know, now's your opportunity. Yeah. Or commonly asked questions, right. too. Right, yeah. If you, too, are an I apostate. Mean, yeah. And you, uh... So... Are yeah. you going to do guests? Are you going to do, like... Um, yeah, I'm going to try to... I'm trying to... Uh, I'm still in the process of writing some messages out to some people that I want to reach out to. I would love to have, like, a rotating panel of you know people mm -hmm. that are familiar with the subject right. and then you know well and, see and what happens there and part of the goal or the design here too right is that like we do this when we do this because this is when i'm available yeah like this is when we can get together to do this and so uh the intent i believe with your show will be that you can just do your show right and then i'll edit it later if you want me to right. or whatever like um, but then, you know, you, you have more flexibility with scheduling and I don't have to be here. And... Right. Well, and that's like why I was thinking, keep it short, because if it's just a 15 to 20, 30 mm -hmm. minute thing, I could do theoretically two or three a week. Yeah. And then, you know, that way, if I have like a, a week where we're out of town or busy, then I don't have to. Right. I can always have something. Well, I in like the can. that. That's good. Yeah. It's a good idea. Anyway. So help me out. Guys. I like that. So ask an apostate. That's what we call yeah. it. Yes. Cool. Yeah, so send in some questions. Uh, I don't have an email set up for you yet, but <laughs> producer at saratalk.com, you can send them there. Or y'all are in the uh, Facebook, Facebook group. You yeah. can find me there. If you're not in the Facebook group. What's wrong with you? Why the hell not? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we want to thank everyone for uh, listening as always, especially those of you who are uh, joining us in the Facebook all the time. <laughs> Russell nominated Dan for the production. I saw that. Uh, we want to oh, thank sorry. all of our wonderful patrons over at patreon.com slash saratalk. And uh, we'll see you next week. Oh, and thanks again to Jordan Allen yes. from Run With Pride. That was a lot of fun. We'll see you next week. 
You've been listening to Sarah Talk. Sarah Talk is made possible by listener support. Visit patreon.com slash Sarah to become a patron and help keep this program going. Contact Sarah and company by email at producer at saratalk.com or call 224-40-SARAH. That's 224-407-2724. And follow us on social media, facebook.com slash Radio, and on Twitter at Saratalk Radio. The opinions and information provided on this show are intended for entertainment purposes only. All opinions are solely that of the hosts and their guests. We make no representations as to accuracy, completeness, timeliness, or validity of any information and will not be liable for any errors or damages. Sarah Talk is a production of Sarah Austin Media.